Make sure. Hi, I think I'm live. Hi everyone, how are you? Uh, this is uh, Friday. Um, gosh, the days are sort of all blending in together. I'm super excited because I have a fabulous plastic surgeon from Los Angeles, fellow Iranian, who is going to be joining me uh, in a few minutes as soon as she gets on. Hi, hi everybody, thanks for joining. Um, I'm really excited because she is a fabulous plastic surgeon, of course, has her own skincare line and has a busy life in general uh, and is very active on social media talking about all aspects of, um, you know, beauty, life, and I think it would be very interesting. I can't wait to speak to her. Let me see if I can add her in. Ugh, I'm so bad at these things. Search. Hmm. No, it's not coming up. Maybe I'm not doing something right. Turning my light on because it's always nice to have that. Um, well, anyway, so basically what I would like to talk about today is um, lots of different things. So one is uh, what people want the most of and the perspective from a female plastic surgeon. So I think it's really important sometimes to have a different perspective and uh, to be able to come from a different point of view. And I think sometimes women have a different way of analyzing and looking. Uh, oh, there she is. Um, let me go live now. Hi. Oh, maybe that was too soon. Connecting, connecting. Hi. And how are you? How are you? I'm super well. How about you? I'm doing good. Hanging in there. I know. <laughs> I, you know, I, I love all your honest posts. I was just saying, you know, it's always nice to have a different perspective from a female plastic yeah. surgeon and mm -hmm. you know you're so busy and I loved your point that you know you're used to your crazy busy life of you know having every minute planned your kids your office your outside extracurriculars and now like sitting back and having to not do anything because you can't is like something you were never prepared for or anybody really in the medical profession. So, and then now you have more time with your kids and your husband and your family and, and um, while that's mm -hmm. nice, like it always makes you feel, I always feel like there's that difficulty in trying to maintain a balance because I don't really think there is a balance. There's always yeah. give and take. I always tell people like it's not a balance. It's more like you have to be happy at work and you have to be happy at home and then try to involve your kids in your work. Like, I have them pack, you know, sample bags for me or like, you know, just take them to talks I give everywhere. Oh, that's so nice. How old yeah, are you? I do. They're 12, 11, and 8. So I took them last year to Copenhagen. They came to Monaco. They came to Paris. They must be so, so I just proud. like try to bring them. Yeah, they are, but I think also, like, you know, it's tough for them because the friends follow me and their teachers follow me, and it's just, you know, working with <laughs> my, like, teenager. <laughs> she's like, okay, all right, already, you know, like, and they're like, your mom is amazing, and she's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know? they'll, they'll appreciate it later, actually. I mean, they'll I, appreciate I, it. I'm just I mean, she's appreciate proud, it. you know. Yes, yeah, so that's, uh, I mean, yeah, that it's, I find that so funny. My, my mom is a doctor, and when I was younger, mm -hmm. I, I only Almost, I was proud, but then I was also, there was a lot of things that she did miss or wasn't a part of. Not that she didn't want right. to be, but um, yeah. I always remember that. And I said, I'm never going to become my mother, and I'm worse than my mother. <laughs> so, I mean, I try to incorporate as much as I can, of course, but it's, it's not always easy. Yeah. But I wanted to chat with you because I think it's really, really different to have a perspective from a female plastic surgeon. And I wanted mm -hmm. to know, so when I look at people, obviously... I see things that perhaps I might see in myself or, you know, I look at areas that I think are beautiful. And when you have somebody, you know, what is the most common thing that people come in to see you for? Is it like the tired body? Is it the tired face? Or is it like, help me with everything? I think it's like everything. I think people come, um, 
And you're right, like, you know, they kind of say, like, you know, you look natural, I want to look natural too, or, like, you're 40, I'm 40, you don't look like an alien, I don't want to look like an alien. <laughs> I think it's, um, I think it's really, it's different to be a female plastic surgeon. I always tell people a male plastic surgeon can look like a troll, and nobody cares, because they're like, sure, do my boobs, you did my friend's boobs, and I don't care what they, they look like, but when you're woman. Yeah, they judge you. There's a higher standard for a woman. Like, if you didn't do Botox and you had wrinkles all over your face, they'd be like, and you're telling somebody they need Botox, they'd be like, well, why don't you do it to yourself? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. But they necessarily wouldn't say that to a man. A man can have wrinkles Never. and do your Botox all day. And gray and so wrinkly. So it's, it's definitely funny. different. <laughs> it's definitely um, different. What, is, uh, what do you love doing the most in terms of face or body? Um, I do a great mix of both, and I think that's why I chose plastic surgery, because I don't want to just do, like, one thing, but I do a lot of breasts, tummy tuck, tons of liposuction with fat transfer, um, but most, most, most labiaplasties and buccal fat pad removal, along with, like, lower face optimization, so I'll use, like, radiofrequency technology with, you know, body tight, face tight. Um, where it actually melts the fat, but also tightens the skin, skin so they don't get, like, jolly. I do a lot of that, and I do a ton of it awake. So, well, that's good. So people know that they can continue doing that, hopefully once COVID, we're out of quarantine. Um, right, exactly. You know, I wanted to ask you, so buccal fat is an interesting one. So I have a lot of patients come in and say they want to, they want to get that nice, beautiful, yeah. shaped, carved look. Um, what do they look like in the long term, like in 10, 10 years? Do you find that those so are the people So I think they kind of got like a bad rap because a lot of um, people were getting it who genetically were predisposed. I always ask them, like I saw three con virtual consults yesterday about buckle fat. And I'm like, they're like, they always ask that because it's all over the internet. I'm like, okay, well, who's, who do you look like? Your mom or your dad's face? And she's like, my dad's face. I'm like, well, you know, how old is He's like he's 56 whatever i'm like is is he gone and she's like no i'm like what about his parents she's like no they're still around so everybody's different you know what i mean like not everybody ages and becomes gone some people yeah. age and they still have a round face so you just ask them that do you think that um if you have that removed and you're more likely to be a rounded face person then you will have uh because you have a little bit of ptosis that help you know that helps make jowling yeah. uh more prominent so do you find that that jowling lifts too or do you find that there's a little so in some um, people so what i tell people is just suck in your cheeks like this that's what you'll look like so it's like the girl yesterday she also she was young she was like young really young and she had jowling already mm. you know just from she had like this it's genetic so i told her if you know suck in your cheeks that's not going to go away so if you want me to get that to go away so you have that nice strong jaw i'm going to have to address that now too and i had a patient i tell them too we can do it separately you can see what you'll look like from the buckle fat and then we can do you know address this later and so i just had a patient that i did three months ago she's like okay i'm ready to do this part now <laughs> I'm like okay and what if you don't tell do? them what would what would you do with the young one that you saw yesterday for instance for i would do acutite i would do acutite and, and get that down a little bit because her dad still has it yeah of and course. she looks just like her dad everybody's different that's the other thing too like i stop being as judgmental of people like you know when somebody comes in and they're like 16 and they have like an issue you're like okay or like they, they're 16 and they come in for a breast augmentation i would be wa almost like walking in ready to tell them no, no but then you go in and you have like the worst tuberous breast deformity you've ever seen and you were judging them in your brain just based off of age and yeah. you walk in and you're like there's no way this girl can change in the locker room looking like that yeah let's fix that you know what i mean you know, so i think that's really important judgmental. I know sometimes, yeah. uh, I mean, age is one of those things though. I mean, uh, I often, I don't have too many young patients. I have a few. Mm -hmm. And um, I always think that if there's something that you can do that bothers you on more days than not, then that's a good indication. So if you're looking at yourself four days out of seven and you're like, I hate that, then you yeah. have to fix it because if you can, if it's not so complicated and the risks outweigh, right. the, you know, the, the, the benefits outweigh the risk, then you should just um, take care of it. But I think that's really important, even when you're young, because it affects your self-confidence so much. Totally. Yeah, and I always check for people. I want to make sure they're doing it for the right reasons. I want to make sure, you know, the family members are on board if it's a minor, you know, and that they're supportive um, and they're not like, oh, she's crazy, you know, whatever. 
Um, so I always like to make sure, like, you know, everybody in the support group is involved in the decision-making process and that the person's really doing it for themselves and not because some boy told them something, you know? Yeah, of course. Well, that's, that's never a good <laughs> indication. <laughs> I wanted to ask you also for going back to um, the jawline because I, I always, my, I, I do I, so a lot of people, always, yeah. you know, the first thing is I look tired, I look tired, I look tired. And then the second thing is, you know, my jowl and my neck. And uh, I loved your Instagram post the other day about the aging neck. And actually, since yeah. doing um, Instagram lives, I hate my neck too. I'm like, oh my god, it's like <laughs> That's so fine, dude. <laughs> I, but you know, you're you're always. I mean, I'm not normally looking at myself, you know, for an hour right. at a time every day. So or you yeah. know, a couple times a week. But um, in terms of uh, doing jawline, where is your boundary? So I do a lot of non-surgical uh, jawline. Um, what, right. is, what is your point where you say, you know what, this is not going to be improved with a, with a technology or with, you know, injectables? Um, you know, there are a lot of people, I use kind of the rule of thumb, if I have more than an inch, then I'm not, or if I don't actually have heavy sagging skin also, it depends on what I'm thinking of doing, then I'm not going to right. be able to help that person. But um, what is your, because now you have, you, you know, you do all of it together. So I think that's also nice to be able to do yeah. So that's, yeah, I, I basically look at it for like three things. I look at it is, is this volume loss related? Like, you know, is, do they need a stronger jawline? Then I would go with filler, which is, you know, what most people do. Then I say, would it be better if I removed volume instead? So instead of putting filler here, here, here to hide this, what if I would just melted that down and tighten that skin non-surgically? with, you know, a radio frequency technology. If the answer is it would probably they probably look better in the long term if I just took that down and then judged it with a little bit, then I'll take that down. And if they're completely skeletonized and it's just skin, then I'll do a facelift. And yeah. um, do you do where do you make your scars for a lower facelift? Always. So, I mean, the other thing too, secret guys, lower facelift, facelift, and neck lift are the exact same thing. It's just those words were invented so women can go tell their friends that they only had their lower face done. Okay? <laughs> so a brow lift is a brow lift. That's not even included in the word facelift. So when you do a facelift, it's the same thing. It's all down here and like right here. <laughs> so basically it's in the hair. It comes behind the ear in a woman, goes underneath the earlobe, behind the ear crease, and then into the hair. And what so if you very just well. had a neck lift? It's the same scar if you just It's the same lift. thing. It's the same exact thing. Because look, if I pull my neck back, where, yeah. what am I going to do with all this tissue? I'm still going to make the same incision. So what, I'm not going to tighten the muscles? Of no, course, of course I not. Of course, all... yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and so um, what about this ponytail lift? I, I, I feel like... So uh, ponytail lift is cool. from LA. That's um, Dr. K.O. Yeah. So he does do like an endo brow. He does do a brow lift. He does put fat in the face, which I do too, like... 90% of the time. Um, so, oh, so his is just, yeah, a brow I find lift. that a lot of times, say that again. So he's just doing an end of the, his ponytail lift is a brow lift essentially. And he's brow doing lift. a brow lift. He's doing the facelift and putting fat in the face. Okay. Oh, so it's a three. So he, he, it's a, it's a lot of, it's a lot. It's the whole face, including <laughs> it's the whole face. Yeah. yeah. And, um, in terms of fat transfer, do you, so you said you do that in 80% of the time for your facelift. Yeah, because, I mean, you have to understand that, you know, facial aging is not just skin laxity. Facial aging is bony loss, muscle loss, fat loss, um, skin laxity. So you have to replace some volume. And if I'm going to be in there anyways, I'm, I usually put fat here. Um, I, sometimes I'll put it into the mid-face here in the lips, earlobes. Really nice lobes in the yeah, I put them in the earlobes, um, and then usually right here as well, because this bony loss happens in all of us. Same at the piriform happens to all of us. So if I can go in there and put a little bit of fat and not require you to have as much filler later on, why not? Know, that's really worth it. And then you know, there's a lot of debate on how much I do a little bit of fat transfer to the face and the lower eyelids. But what what um, do you tell your patients in terms of resorption of fat for? Mm -hmm. I usually tell them in the face. I think like about seventy five percent of it lives. When it's other areas of the body, I usually say fifty to seventy percent. And where else do you but do yeah. it in the body? Breasts and, and to the breasts, to the butt, to the hips. Um, I've done it even um, to the knees. I had a man that was in a motorcycle accident, and he lost a lot of muscle. 
in, in one leg. So when he sat down in shorts, it was really weird looking. So I did some fat transfer to the knees. I do it underneath burn scars. It just wherever right, anywhere going. anywhere you can uh, anywhere you can put it. And do you ever tell a patient? Um, so sometimes I get worried around the eyes because I think the eyes, the, yeah. the skin around the eyes is really um, you know pretty unforgiving um so yeah. sometimes i i do filler in those patients who i think would benefit just from a little bit of fat so that they can see what it looks like do you ever do that or do you like to do it i tend to actually not use fat very much underneath the eyes because i just have too many cases of people coming in uh, with lumps and bumps and it's really difficult to fix so i i usually tend to just do filler in those areas and some prp Mm -hmm. Um, but technically, you know, with nano fat and really getting that fat down to a, a yeah, really small like pieces, a liquid, like a I feel a little bit more comfortable, especially in the mid phase, but I, pro I, I don't tell them if I do this video, you'll never need filler again. I just say, you know what, I'm sort of lifting the mid phase, bringing some volume back, especially if that, they have that line that kind of goes all the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I tend to stick with filler under the eyes. Um, and I wanted to also ask in terms of what do you do for the forehead, rejuvenation of the forehead? I feel like this So you mean like when it gets, it loses its con... Yeah, so when you get when it loses its... You get, you get concave here. So do you do, when you do your surgeries, do you also do fat tra transfer there or nano fat transfer? I have done fat transfer in those areas and I've also done filler in those areas. Is there a, a, what about you? What do you like? I, I well, I've never done fat there um, because I think again, if you're if you, a lot of people who come in with that already have very um, volume lost or depleted skin, also mm -hmm. from years of botulinum toxins. So I think like you know the fact that they've been doing injections for so long has also you know atrophied that muscle a little bit. And so I'm always wary. Mm -hmm. The people who I feel need it the most are usually the ones that have the thinnest skin in that area. So I use a very light filler and I'm extremely, I, I use very small quantities and I just say, you know, you're yeah. going to have to come back. I take it very slowly there. Um, mainly because I, one, I, you know, there's a lot of blood vessels in that area. Even if you're low, you yeah. never know what's there. And then two, I also think it's really um, I'm not forgiving too. And you might need to have massage. It's, it's easier to mm -hmm. take mm -hmm. your time than to do more and then have issues later. So, um, yeah, with the fillers there, I do tend to dilute it out a little bit too, thin it out. And which is like your I do favorite? One to one thinning out. Oh, oh yeah. So I I've done that sailing times. Yeah. And which is your filler of? Do you have one of preference for particular areas? Um, I I, t I love refine for a lot of areas, but I mean I have the gamut. I have every filler FDA cleared <laughs> in the states to use, Amazing. and it just depends on the person. And I think you need to have that experience in order to be able to choose. Like, okay, this is a thicker skin person, or this is a thinner skin person. I'm going to dilute this one. I'm going to use a thin filler and dilute it. So I just think you know there isn't one filler that I'm like no. this is my only filler. You know, um, I just tend to do what's right for that person anatomically and what their goals are. Someone asked here, um, what about threads? What are your thoughts on threads? I, I think the smooth threads for, you know, when somebody comes in and they smile and they have like 50 lines here, I think doing a lattice of like smooth threads is fine. I'm not a big fan of barb threads just because I have better technology. Um, I think face tight um, and AccuTight do a much better job. The downtime is exactly the same and I can get a three to five year result from that. Whereas with threads, they come in Dimpling is very common. I see a lot. That, of that. thing is not going to hold your face up for more than three months max. So you get all these patients coming back and saying, "Oh, give me a free thread, give me a free thread." Um, so I think the complications are higher. I think it doesn't work as well, and I just I'm not a big fan of barb threads. I think people that use them just don't have better technology. When you use the smooth threads, do you find if you did a facelift later that there's any difficulty in 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 that none? Thing? Well, that's good on that side. Yeah. I don't like I mean, it's either. dissolved, right? It, it is dissolved, but I always wonder if there's some scarring, especially in some people who have like a lot of excess puckering or they have edema in that area. I've taken out a whole bunch that like sort of not, uh, not the skin, yeah. but the barbed ones that have come from the skin and, you know, yeah. fire removal. I, I, I am not a like, fan of barbed. Why would you want to, no. you know, put yourself through that, at least do something more invasive or less. Do you know what I do? I actually keep it on my website and it's one of the most, one of the most viewed videos really? on my YouTube and I keep it there. So people call and I get the leads and then I can educate them as to a better, 
I, I, I did have it. I took mine off because I stopped doing it. And then I had a patient who was very upset that she came all that way to discuss threads. And I was like mm -hmm. trying to talk her out of it. I was like, but there are better things. And what is your take on HIFU? So there was a question here. Do you do all therapy or any other HIFU technologies? Again, I'm not... Um I think that radio frequency is much better results, and I think it's much less painful. Um, so I, uh, I'm not a big fan of um, micro ultrasound. Um, I think that radio frequency does a much better job, hurts way less. Yeah, it does hurt less. Um, and, do it with uh, the outcomes like are much more reproducible. I think with microneedling, sometimes radio frequency hurts a bit more. I've tried both of them in my jawline. Which one do you have, though? Morpheus 8. Um, Morpheus 8 doesn't hurt. Oh, my God. It's good. Oh, my God. I, you need I, to get a better numbing cream, girl. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, send you some, some oh my God. I references. Was, I mean, I was on the lowest setting, and I was dying, but I know I have a very low thresh painful, like a low pain threshold. Um, I, I do, too, but I literally do it to myself. Do you? My numbing cream, though, is insane because I'm such a wuss. Use? I have it compounded, okay, and, so and I went through six compounding oh. pharmacies before I liked this one. Oh, I might Because I know, because that. I use it on myself, so I know yeah. if things don't work or not. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, and I've tried all that, and actually with just, you know, some ibuprofen and Paris, you know, some oral medication, yeah. most people don't have any problem. But I think Haifu is really best for people who have um, the thicker, heavier skin types that, like, can, can mm -hmm. be lifted. Because although they don't say that there's fat atrophy, I think part of it is, is that it it heats up that fat and so it shrinks and shrivels a little bit. So, um, but I, yeah. I do like the Morpheus 8 because it also, you have skin remodeling at the same time with the microneedling, which is really yes. nice. Um, yeah. But I don't think either of those guys are great for the for like a brow lift. I mean, you can, I think a lot of times in the upper third of the face, it's volume loss and just laxity of skin. But if you if you just, if you tighten it, of course, you're always going to have better skin quality. But you're, I don't think you can get, you know, with all therapy, they say one to three millimeters of lift. And I think if you get one, that's a fairly good result. And I don't know. <laughs> I know, but see, know, that's not worth it to me. Like, not. you know what I mean? But I don't think radio frequency in that area is particularly great either. I, mean, I, feel like I will tell longer. you, I, maybe it's because I do have, you know, a younger um, population, but yeah, I literally fun. very rarely uh -huh. see the need for a bra lift. Uh, very, yeah, very yeah, rarely. Yes. And do you do endoscopic, I'm assuming, bra lifts? Or? No, I'll do direct. You do direct? In women yeah. and men? Yeah, from up here in the hairline. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And if it's an older, older man, I don't even mind putting it there because it doesn't even show because they have so many wrinkles. So do you ever do forehead reduction then? No, it's not my jam. <laughs> I mean, there's a guy in my building who does a lot of them. Um, and I think he's, you know, you just sort of like SEO the crap out of that. So <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> I think it, a lot of people go to them. Yeah, exactly. I always think that that's, um, I'd be, I, I would love to have a shorter hairline too, but like, I, that's just too invasive for me. I mean, like, I'm yeah, very no, you're good. That. Um, yeah, you are good. There, there are so many, there's a bunch of questions that about, um, hmm, do you use mainly cannula or needles? Probably a combination of both. Needles. You, oh, you don't use cannula at all? I'll only use it when I don't care where the product are going. So, for example, for Sculptra, I'll use cannula. For PRP, I'll use cannula because those are just like spreading seeds. Yeah. But if I want to be accurate, I'm going to use a needle. Okay. And um, and that's I, I like to use both. So the, I, I do do – and the tear trough, I, I do put a lot of um, cannula. And uh, I don't like it. I think it looks like a sausage in my hands. I, I really like to do micro droplets right on the bone. Um, so I, I have, to, and I don't know, maybe I'm also biased because I get all the people who had cannula and then they come to I me to get it those. reversed. Uh, that's actually something that I had a few questions on in my um, stories or whatever. What's your take on hyaluronidase or hyalase or... The, the, the Use it every day almost to reverse crazy looking people. So there are a lot of people going, or I do too. I use it quite a lot. And... Um, I, I, I do a lot of the complications that happen even within my own clinic because we're a bunch of doctors that work there and I do the most injectable. So I end up doing yeah. a lot of those. But, um, you know, there's always this big fear. I've never had anybody who has lost anything permanently um, in terms of having 
high waist done. And so I I don't know why so many people come in thinking that you know if they do if they have the you know some of their filler removed that they're going to lose some of their own collagen. But I I always feel like it's very difficult to be able to um, manage that kind of expectation. So what, what do you tell mm -hmm. your patients or do they actually, they're happy and fine and they say, don't, no questions. Yeah, they're fine. I tell them that's not something they need to worry about. I've never seen it happen from my patients. Have you ever seen that happen? I haven't. I have seen once um, that was not permanent. Someone came in with actually two sausages, one here and one here. And I put a very, I don't, I actually think it works really well in very low dilution. So I don't need to, yeah. I, don't, I don't, I don't make it super concentrated unless there's mm -hmm. something more sinister happening. Um, but in that situation, I put a very small amount and he came in the next day with a very, uh, deep, um, you know, volume loss, and uh, but also a lot of swelling in his cheek, and he was freaking out. And I said, "That's going to go down. Give it a few days." And yeah. after three or four, I days have that seen also an allergic reaction kind of looking picture for a few days after Hylinex, but only in two patients in my entire career. And uh, do you do a patch test on people with high, you know, that you want to remove? No, I don't either. No. Interesting. <laughs> I just tell them if you do get swelling, ice it, and it'll be gone in three days. And honestly, I've only had two patients ever get that. Always good to know. And then I, yeah. going back to the breast, because fat transfer to the breast, I've had a lot of people asking me about this, too, because, um, you know, a lot of people don't want to have implants in their in their breasts, mm -hmm. and also when you've done breastfeeding or you've had volume loss and changes in your upper body, uh, and you've already had historically larger breasts, sometimes it's just the tissue quality um, in that mm -hmm. area that's almost like that top part of the bra that you know that doesn't fill out the way that it did before. So, how do you approach those patients, and when do you you know when do you say is it fat? Is it a is it a lift? Is it you know combination of PRP and other technologies? Is it all of them together? Right. You know, what do you? Yeah. That's so basically, I, um, I look at where their nipple placement is, and I look at how much skin envelope they have of the whole breast, and kind of what their goals are, and that helps me decide if they're actually sagging or if they're just deflated. It's looking at the position of the nipple and also just how much skin there is. Um, I make the measurements. Um, you know, from their sternal notch down to the crease under their breast. And that also helps me decide whether they have sagging or not, whether they need a lift or not. As, as if they don't need a lift or they do, um, then I look at, you know, their volume. I ask them, are you happy with the size that you are? Um, when you are in a bra, do you like how big that is? Um, and then based off of that, we'll decide if we want to add volume or not. And then the conversation then will go to, you know, fat transfer versus an implant. Um, I always tell them with fat transfer, the fat isn't like an implant that I could just put as much as fat as I want. It's all going to live. I, I tell them fat's like spaghetti. I put it in in little strings like spaghetti into the existing breast tissue. And all of the fat on the outside of the spaghetti lives because it's breathing and, and getting nutrition from surrounding fat cells. And all of the fat on the inside of the spaghetti dies. So as we do fat transfers, whether we want to do one, two, or even three, every time you're going to get more fat live because I can fit more spaghetti into more breast tissue. So if they come in with an A, I can't get them to a D with fat no. because I can't put that much spaghetti inside of an A cup. Maybe I can get them to a B and then maybe from a B I can get them to a full C. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, whereas with an implant, I can put in whatever size I want as far as, you know, as long as their skin can handle it. Um, and they don't have to also worry about if I lose weight, will my breasts shrink? It's another one. Because sometimes after you do fat transfer to the breast, they're like, oh my God, I'm so cute. Then they start working out. They lose 15 pounds. And fat's stupid. It doesn't know if it's in your stomach and your love handles or in your breast. It you lose weight, it shrinks. You gain weight, it grows. So that's another question I ask them is, are you at your ideal body weight? And are you planning on losing weight after the surgery? Because I tell them if you do lose weight, your breasts will shrink. So... That's, All of those what things about in go the into it. In the decolletage, do you use uh, do you use fat in there? I use PRP there. I use Sculptra there. Um, I haven't used a lot of fat there, uh, and I also do a ton of like um, lasers and Halo and my, like, laser microneedling. Um, in order to build collagen in that area and also the skin creams at home in order to help with um, you know the col discoloration and also to build collagen. And you have your own skincare line too. 
Yeah, I'm working. I'm working on it all the time. Um, updating it, um, coming, you know, finding new ingredients. Uh, but I, you know, I think that I think that every skincare line has its hero products, and that's kind of why I started the Skin Spot is because we don't bring on every single SKU from every brand. We look for only medical grade brands. And then we bring on their hero products, their yeah. best sellers, the ones that people keep coming back. And that's why um, it's growing so quickly right now because people are thirsty for expert advice. Of course. They are kind of, there's kind of a backlash against the influencer saying like, oh yeah, you know, like I love this product. And then next week, I love this product. Yeah, I you know? Actually, I, so, I find that really disheartening when someone's like constantly plugging a different thing. You know, there's no authenticity yeah. to it at all. And no science to yeah. it. I mean, everybody's an expert these days. So, um, what's your favorite right. serum? Someone, someone's just, a, just a banana says your serum is amazing. You know, it Which really depends. You know, I've brought on probably only I would say seven or eight serums onto the skin spot because it depends on what kind of skin you have. Yeah. You know, are you acneic? Are you dry? Are you oily? Um, are you aged? Like, you know, so I just think like different serums are different for people's needs. So for most of the products on the site, I created videos too, like Zappos, you know? Oh, wow. And I kind of say that. like, this is great for this type of skin. If, you, if you're like darker than me, this tint is going to look chalky on you or whatever, just to help guide people as to what will be the perfect product for them, knowing full well that the fact that you are looking at medical grade that has been like scientifically studied and proven, you're already winning. Like it's very difficult to lose and go wrong when you've switched to medical grade. So I don't think it's about which serum for most people. It's about use medical grade products, not the crap you buy at the drugstore. I agree with you there. I wanted to, how did you get into the skincare? So I love, uh, you know, part of the thing that I do is that, so I, I have this weird story. I trained and did everything in the States and then I moved to London because of my husband and I had to do like a little bit of extra and I had to move away for a couple of years and I ended up doing dermatology just because I was doing nothing and I don't like to do nothing. So right. and then I started and I was like, you know, there's so much to do before you need to have surgery. And that's how I got into lasers yeah. and I was doing some research with hyaluronic acid and that's how I got into fillers. But um, skincare kind of like happened because of my husband. So like it, it wasn't in, at all part of the loop for me. But um, I think it's important to have that comprehension because like when you have surgery on any part of your body, it's not like you do it and then you're done. I mean, you, you are done with some things, but then you have to maintain it like everything, like your hair, your nails, your muscles, you know, you yeah. can't just do one thing and say I'm done. So yeah. um, how do you counsel like you know, your patients in terms of their aftercare after surgery. So, you know, I actually like start the conversation. I actually do pre-care as well. Okay. So I actually start them on products even before they come in for the surgery, because what I found is when I was doing my facelifts, um, they looked great, but the skin still wasn't great. And I found yeah. that there was kind of like a discord and, and that was a giveaway that maybe they had had something done. So I think it's all about addressing all the different ways that we age and giving an overall impression of skin health and liftedness and youthfulness. And then people just say like, wow, you look so good. What did you do? Rather than being like, what'd you do? Yeah, you know, like yeah, something yeah. doesn't make sense. So after doing some of my facelifts, I was like, you know what? It's, um, it's kind of like making a bed. Uh, I'm full of like metaphors, but it's kind of like I making a bed. Like I can pull the sheets. Yeah, I can pull the sheets as tight as I want and tuck them in neatly. But if there's a big stain on the sheets and the sheets are wrinkled, that's still not a bed you want to sleep in. That's gross. So it's all about removing the stains, ironing the sheets, and then tucking them appropriately. And do you do, so you do that before you do surgery? So you like Before and after for maintenance, after. yeah. And always like with my surgeries, I create a maintenance plan because, for example, a facelift doesn't necessarily put collagen into your face. No. So if you don't do some microneedling RF afterwards or beforehand, you won't maintain your results. Um, so I'm all about, you know, even after doing surgery saying, all right, and this is going to be your maintenance, you know, four times a year, you're going to come in and we're going to do this. And every time you come in, we're going to assess and see what else it is that we need to do to maintain your results. Because it's kind of like going to the gym, getting a six pack and being like, okay, I'm done. Like you're not done. <laughs> 
<laughs> and people are asking, do you do some of these lasers at the time of your facelift, or do you do that? Yes, like I do. Um, yeah. So, for example, I saw a consult yesterday where a uh, beautiful body, like, works out amazing and wanted a small breast augmentation, but had horrible sun damage to the chest. So I said, you know what, while we're doing your breast dog, I'm also going to do these two lasers on your chest so that you're not like, I look great, but my skin's like, yeah, you know, so. just shows what I've done to it all these years. So it's, again, just taking a really holistic approach at youthfulness and at beauty and knowing also once I give the person what they want, then they're going to notice this. And if they're asleep and they don't have to feel any discomfort from the laser, why, why wouldn't not? I do it at the same time? And they're having the downtime anyway, so why wouldn't you address it at the same time? I, 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 I say just go under surgery and have it all done at the same time <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when it's time for me. But, uh, um, yeah, I, 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 that's, I think that's really important also. Like, you can't just look at one thing. I, I was going to ask you, the one thing that I always have difficulty with people who've had facelifts elsewhere and they have um, not great scars um, yeah, you know, I, there's actually a tattoo um, woman in LA who's amazing. Um, I love her, Bosma. Yes, exactly, Bosma. So yeah, she does amazing work, and so I've sent a bunch of people to her, and she comes also to Europe quite a bit. So yeah. it's um, really nice. But um, what do you recommend for those people who come in acutely? So a lot of people travel for their as you know, this is a yes. really big decision, and you know you have to go to somebody you think is great and that you can have that communication and rapport with but sometimes aftercare is not as great if you leave too abruptly and you don't have time to be reevaluated by the surgeon who's treated you so for these right. kinds of lifts um you know and the scarring that happens here where people come and then i see the stitches and i'm taking out other people's stitches it's uh without anybody you know saying what they've yeah. done I, I can see what they've done but you know um what is your recommendation for people in that healing process like for them yeah, so sun um, avoidance obviously is very important, but I use Silogen products. Um, starting at two weeks, we start with a gel morning and night. And then we, at one month, we use the gel during the day and we use silicone sheeting at night. So, and that's done really well for us. I mean, thank God, knock on wood, even our dark skinned people um, have healed very well. The other thing is suture choice. I mean, using um, a removable suture like a 6 0 proline, um, simple sutures in, the, you know, in this area heals beautifully. So thank God. And then the other thing too is a dead giveaway with a facelift is when the ear is pulling. Yes. Yeah, so um, that, you worst just learn ever. techniques. Like when I sew it, I actually leave like an extra half a centimeter there and bunch it. And then when it heals and they stand up, it looks perfect mm -hmm. without looking like a, you know, their earlobes getting pulled down. So there's, there's experience, there's tricks uh, to making things heal best. And it's not always just scar therapy. Sometimes it's about surgical technique and knowing how to make your incisions and how to leave a little bit of extra skin in this one little particular area so that there isn't tension and that the scar does not spread. And do you do earlobe reductions at the same time? I always feel that a, a lot of times I do. I just actually um, proofed one yesterday to be put on our new website coming out soon. Uh, are you working on your website? So what are you doing right now? We've been working on our website for like a year. <laughs> It's, it's, but this so is like hard. wonderful because um, during this time, it's really allowed us to put in the effort to get it done. So it's good. And then it'll be time to redo it because, you know, technology. <laughs> no, no. It's like wonderful. It's so good. We're like, I'm like obsessed with it. I just can't wait for it to come out, but it has to, you know, be right. Of course. Um, and then you have so many Instagram accounts. So what are your other ones now? So like you have, uh, what, what is it? The I have Dr. Sheila Nazarian, which is more like lifestyle, motivational. I'll put some before and afters on it. And we'll t I'll talk about skincare sometimes, but it's really like, that's my life. Um, and then I have the model surgeon, which I is the like the gore and the guts and the blood like and the like surgeries. That. And we'll do live surgery on that one. And then um, I have Spa 26 official and that's our spa. So that's the injectables, the lasers, the non-invasive things. And then we have the skin spot, which is 
the e-commerce site, which has only the medical grade skincare that we've been talking about. And the last one is called Think Big, which is my conference I have every year, which is kind of um, permission to think outside the box, permission to pivot your career. Just because you studied medicine doesn't mean you lack creativity in other areas. And just kind of giving permission for people to um, fulfill uh, their entrepreneurial side and also um, just think outside the box and you know see where it goes so what comes out of that I didn't know about the last one I didn't know about so what tell oh me it's lovely about. it's awesome so we, I mean I don't know how it's going to play out in um, 2021 but uh, we've had three conferences it's a yearly conference we had our first year Tamara Mellon who makes the shoes she was she was the co-founder of Jimmy Choo she was our first keynote and then the second year uh, we had uh, the founder of uh, Guilt Dot com and Glam Squad, um, Alexandra, she was our keynote there, as well as Bethany Frankel from Shark Tank and the Housewives wow. of New York. Wow, amazing. And then yeah. last year, we had Chris Jenner as our keynote speaker, which was amazing. She was outstanding. But basically, the first day is really about what business owners need to know. So anything from um, how to prevent employee theft to how to uh, identify your brand to... Um, you know, customer experience. And then the second day is really about what's holding you back. So the second day, there's always tears. <laughs> we have grown men crying. But it's really about, you know, we're all perfectionists. What are we afraid of? What are you afraid of? What's holding you back from achieving your full potential? Is it what, what other people are going to think about you? What your colleagues are going to say? Maybe it's not going to be perfect, so I'm not even going to start. You know, things like that, that I think these type A medical or otherwise yeah. it's not just for medical people either but it's mostly medical people that show up just because that's who follows me but um it's really just giving people permission to really delve deeper pause do some introspection and really see why haven't i started that thing that i know is going to be great and what successes have you had come out of it or do you, do you i mean i'm assuming honestly the on. biggest successes that we've had is um the last two years we had um two individuals reach out to us and say that they were actually suicidal before the meeting and that the meeting saved their life really wow yeah and why did you start this? Like, what, what was the reason? I just did? thought that there was a need, you know? I feel like all the conferences we go to is about technique and maybe a little bit about business, but always somebody has something to sell to you. Yeah. So it was really just out of, you know, wanting to sort of bring plastic surgery into, you know, the future and allowing people to post on social media and give that expert advice because if we don't do it, there's a void and that's where non-experts come in claiming to be experts. So that re it really came from that. And then the second day about introspection, I just thought there was a true need for that for our, our you know for doctors and medical people because we're, we always just take care of other people and forget to take care of ourselves so that's i just nice thought that it was a void i love it i might i mean i know it's really special i mean it's that. like camp people come back year after year and like make lifelong friends with the people that were sitting at their table and it was something that i didn't expect but i feel like these things when you start them sometimes they grow into their own thing and yeah, maybe a lot work. bigger than you originally intended which is probably what happened i mean you you have so many different aspects i don't know how you manage all your time and you know what do you I think, think i need to like show the like slow down like but why have you know you, really just sort of say you life? know i've you know i've succeeded everything i set out to do i did i don't have anything to prove to anyone else or myself and when am i just going to sit back and really enjoy my house enjoy my children enjoy this life that i've built and i think those are questions that i'm really grappling with right now but you didn't like how do i want to go back i don't want to go back the way i was because that I wasn't don't either. i don't need healthy either. But I, I think sometimes, you, you know, like you said, with, with this meeting, sometimes things morph and then you, you know, it gets bigger than what it is. And so I think also you may say that, but then, you know, because you're a doctor and you've been trained all your life to help other people, if someone says, can you do this? I mean, I'm a yes person normally. I mean, like that whole thing yeah. of saying no is very difficult, but um, I have to start doing that more. But I, I also like the other side too. So, you know, going back, I can say that I want to change it now, but I feel like if I'm in that position, I like all that busyness and I like being involved with lots of different things. So I think that's, yeah. 
that's going to be I think this virtual thing is amazing, though. Like, I think, you know, doing these virtual conferences um, and virtual consults and not, you know, you know, having people, like, drive to see me in order to just, like, get my opinion, that I'm not going to change. So I think the first meeting I have with everyone will be virtual. And then if they want to move forward, then we have an in-person meeting and treat. Oh, that's uh, that's really interesting. So I called my insurance um, just like uh, just to see what the situation is here in terms of virtual, and they they were saying you even if you have a virtual for us and with my particular insurance that I actually have to see them all over again and start from scratch. Mm. So um, I thought that was kind of interesting. I, I mean, I'm doing them now too because one, I do miss my patients. I miss that contact. Yeah, I do think that you know this COVID has shown that you can do a lot of things remotely and I'm hoping a lot of conferences will also be able to be done remotely too. So, you know, with a kid's a busy life, everything else, all, your own school holidays and every, you know, just life. Sometimes it's hard to go to all the meetings you want to go to, even though you really want to be there. So it would be nice right. to be able to dip in and out. And I feel that now we that we know it's not as hard as we think it is because we've had to do it that uh, now we're homeschooling i mean like i i would never have done that a month ago so i know so you know just to, to be able to do that i think would be really great for um for all businesses not just medicine but you know to be able to be a part of conferences and meetings and get to know people mm -hmm. and also for patient um follow-up too without them thinking it's there's a scary, difficult component to it. So technology has become... Yeah, so most of my patients are like super professional, busy women. So it's been such a blessing to just be able to do like a 20, 30 minute virtual consult for them and be able to fit that anywhere in their day yeah. rather than making it a whole thing. You know, we have them fill out their all their paperwork from home. They submit their photos from home, you know, even like I'm thinking, you know, when the quote's sent to them, they can do their consents from home. That way, when they come in, Less there effort. is not as much touch, you know, yeah. and they can just literally just walk straight into the treatment room, not have to sit down in the waiting room and just get treated and leave. I'm even th thinking, you know, payments from home, just get it all out of the way. So there's literally like a no touch Policy. experience from when they come in i'm working all of this stuff out now and trying to figure out exactly you know what the logistics of it will be but i think um that will make people feel a lot more comfortable my staff and the patients just to know you know everything's sort of taken care of on the front end you come in you treat and you are out yes I think that sounds, as a patient, a potential patient, I, that sounds heaven to me too. I mean, who wants to sit in a doctor's office for an extra half hour, an hour, or whatever it is, just to fill out no paperwork and do payment? So, much rather do that while I'm, you know, watching Netflix or something. Exactly. Um, <laughs> that's always a better, always a better combination. And I wanted to also ask you about mummy makeovers because um, I feel. I also have like so many patients that are, are scared because a mummy makeover sounds like you're doing so much at the same time. And mm -hmm. my view is actually the opposite. I always feel like, well, if you're going to have the downtime and you're going to have an anesthetic and, um, you know, there are multiple things that are bothering you, why not do it together if it's possible so like right i always say if it's safe and you're healthy do it all together but i never pressure people to do it all together but i do feel a responsibility to tell them that it is possible to do it all together because in the beginning of my career somebody would come in for example for a breast reduction and they also had like an apron of skin hanging over their c-section scar like literally an apron yeah. like a lot of skin and I, and I would feel like a car salesman and i would feel pushy if i said you know what we could do your tummy tuck at the same time so i wouldn't even say it and then after a year of like getting to know the person i'm like you know what we could do uh, something for that and they're like oh my god why didn't you tell me a year ago i would have done it at the same time so i feel like it's best to educate people and say you know what it is safe you're healthy you know um to do these two at the same time however if you don't feel comfortable with that i'm happy to push them into two separate surgeries but you just need to know then you'll have two down times and also the first hour of anesthesia is the most expensive so there is additional cost so there is cost savings doing them at the same time and also one downtime instead of two especially with people that are moms or they're professional women it, it life is busy it's really hard to have two downtimes so i always just inform people and then let them make the final decision and then you were talking about um, bums uh, doing uh, fat transfer there. Are you still doing that? You are. 
Yes, I'm still doing that. But uh, my whole thing is just supernatural results. So I'm not doing like one liter into each butt cheek or anything like that. I'm literally just doing it to give a lift and a rounded, smooth appearance rather than like just shoving a ton of fat into people's butts and making them look crazy. I don't do that. Okay. If, if somebody asked me to do it, I wouldn't do it. And have you taken any fat out on people who've had it done before? I'm always curious. Like, that to me, like, I, I have. feel like if you're going to have that big bum, at some point that bum's going to fall, and then you're going to have a big fat. You know bum. what? It actually hasn't been shown to fall. Really? It stays up? Yeah. We all said that in the beginning, um, and it's been, like, you know, probably it's Five been years? close to a decade, and we're just okay. not seeing that. Oh. That's interesting. It's not like breasts. <laughs> we thought it would be. Yeah, I would imagine it would be. What about banana rolls? Mm -hmm. I body tight those. It's like a miracle. Is it? I literally go in, I'll heat the area up, melt that fat in a really smooth way, and, and the skin just sucks right in. That was one of like the first cases I used for body tight, and after that I just became an addict because the results were so ridiculously good. And why is it better than having liposuction? Because it tightens the skin, it like sucks it in, and then also it gives a really smooth melt because of the raising of the temperature. So basically, you're turning the fat into oil. Lovely. So on certain areas where it's really prone to divoting, it's really nice to be able to go in with that tool. It makes you look really good. It just makes you look like a badass surgeon. Which areas are prone to dimpling with liposuction? So I would say thighs. Um, so do you abdomen only use that and people now? that are really thin. So do you only use that now for thighs? No, I use it all over the body. You use it everywhere, okay. Yeah, I use it everywhere. But I mean, also the upper abdomen, you know, especially over the ribs. I feel like a lot of people don't, they miss that area. Those little, little two fat things over yeah, the ribs. Um, like so I love using breath. it there. It gives a really nice result, smooth melt. Uh, so divoting uh, in the legs and in that, actually it's true, there are a lot of people who walk around who had liposuction on their stomach and then they forget to, or they haven't done that upper one third of the, of the abdomen, which is really weird. What about for the belly button? What do you do for belly button skin? So I actually do use Accutite, which is a very similar technology to tighten up that skin along with Morpheus 8. I think the two is a very good combination. Um, but if they've had like, if they had a belly ring in or if they have a horrible stretch mark right there, I'll go Go ahead and just directly excise it so, so much information it's it, there's just it's, <laughs> it's, it's amazing and then what about ankles like we did a talk the other day with um, another fellow colleague who actually I saw him on here but um what do you do for ankles cankles I will do liposuction on them I stayed away from it for a long time and then because I just heard like oh it's swollen forever blah 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 but I've done it ooh, in a lot of patients now um and I do like to do that asleep because I do think it is slightly more uncomfortable okay. than other areas of the body but I will do liposuction of the ankles and it's a fantastic result I mean people can't get into boots beforehand oh, wow. um and yeah. then they're able to wear normal shoes and boots again and do you like lipo for the knee area or do you usually i do i do with liposuction body with body tight so the the light makes the legs look so much longer unless you have long legs like yourself and then you don't need anything <laughs> <laughs> and, and and um gosh there's so many questions i'm trying i'm trying to incorporate them into what i'm saying but um uh, yeah, I'm going to actually try and put this up so you can, don't need to take notes, guys. But um, yeah. uh, what do you recommend for girls with no hips but want to have hips? Is that, would you also do fat transfer there? Yeah, so I do one of two procedures. Either I'll do fat transfer if they have fat, which is kind of nice because actually transferring your own fat is a twofer. So you're getting liposuction in the area where you don't want it and you're getting to move the fat where you do want it. Um, and it's actually cheaper, that surgery, than, than the next option, which is actually to put filler. Um, and it's not the filler you would use in your lips, for example, but I use a combination of Sculptra, which is lactic acid particles. When you go to the gym and you feel the burn, that's lactic acid. Um, when it's injected, the lactic acid, it forms your own collagen around it, which is longer lasting than the fillers we would use, for example, in your lips. Um, the other... Uh, 
thing that I use with it is Renuva. Renuva is a cadaveric fat, so it's dead people fat that's been irradiated, and so it's just the scaffolding of the fat that's left. There's no cells in it or viruses or anything like that. And um, when that's injected, it actually tells your own body to, to make fat there and collagen. So I find that those two put together um, gives short-term and long-term results, and it's very expensive though, much more expensive than the fat transfer. But for some people, they have no fat, and um, it's it's wonderful. I've actually done that one on myself. It's lovely. You did the fat transfer on yourself? No, I did the injections on myself. Ah, you did. And how mm -hmm. many vials did you have to use? I used, I believe, 24 vials of Sculptra and 12 um, 1.5s of the Renuva. Wow. So that's very expensive. Just very expensive. <laughs> and, um, yes. and now some people are asking also about double chins. What do you do for the double chin? So if it's just like really good skin and there's good recoil, I'll just do liposuction. And I do that awake in the office all the time. It takes like half an hour. Um, if there is some skin laxity or I'm worried about laxity after I deflate the area, I don't want to take away fat and then give somebody like, you know, extra skin. That just, that doesn't help them. You just took away one problem, but you gave them another problem. So I will use the radio frequency technology in that area. Also awake. Sounds like bacon cooking. It's really interesting. But then that way they melt the fat and then the skin also sucks in. I just posted probably like maybe 10 posts ago or, or t within 10 to 20 posts ago, a woman that I did that on and it's literally like a facelift result. It's crazy. Well, you know, I see some people who have a scar, a submental scar here. Uh, is that where they're just trying to, is that just to, to tighten suffer? the muscles, platysmoplasty. But um, that has not very nice, in my opinion, like long term. I feel like you can always see that as you get older, the platysmal bands actually show a little bit more and you get this weird it's almost like flat and then you get this weird thing which almost draws your eye more to that area than if you had just normal there's different methods of doing it so sometimes they'll do it and then they'll cut the bottom of the platysma so that that doesn't happen does it make sit-ups harder joking <laughs> <laughs> joking um uh, i i think that i mean there's tons there's stretch marks people are asking about stretch marks lots of different things but if there was one thing that you had to tell your patient like kind of going into an appointment um i think always expectations are sort of important because um you know you're beautiful you're super successful you have all these things going and so obviously there's like also a lot of um you know admiration when people come in and when they choose who they want to see as their doctor or their surgeon and so mm -hmm. and I think you know some of it is genetic some of it is a lot of hard work and some of it might be a little bit of help but what do you say to people because sometimes I, I think the expectations are always the hardest to you know control even if you show before and after pictures and you know it, it's sometimes like oh I have a discussion and I say this is what I think is best and they still go for a different option and I say and then afterwards they say well this isn't quite what I wanted and and it's almost that whole even if it's documented and I've written letter you know it doesn't matter it's they, that's what they have in their mind and that always makes me as a surgeon and doctor feel bad because obviously we never want to do anything that makes you know our whole purpose is to make people happy that's that's sort of the whole idea right. behind aesthetics anyway so what do you do <laughs> what do you do for you know to try so i do that? a couple things on my before and afters on my website i will actually put my before and afters. I don't just pick the best ones to put because I think that people will get a better idea and it's kind of pre-screens people and brings in normal people that have more realistic expectations rather than just posting like only the models, you know, that like anybody yeah, can make look good. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so I think it's really important to have sort of all your before and afters, not just like the models. Um, that's number one. Number two, I really pick my patients carefully. So people think that when they come to see me or we're doing a virtual consult that they're interviewing me no I'm interviewing you <laughs> I'm interviewing you and I'm asking myself constantly is this person capable of happiness and if the answer in my brain is no I am not the right doctor for you and you need to go find somebody else and I've had very very good luck with that so Good um, I, I actually listen for the patient to say something like, I know this will never go away, or I know it won't be perfect, but, you know, I just want it to be better. Things like that sort of tell me and are clues to me that that person's normal and they're not psychotic.
<laughs> so, um, and also like, maybe I even think I can make them perfect, you know, but I would never say that. I never say things like hundred percent. I never wow. say guarantee. And I never use the word perfect. Yeah, of course. I say things like be better, different, improved, improved yeah. you know? And if somebody uses the word perfect, I say no. Or like, I'll say like, mm, that kind of scares me that you said that because you know, that's never going to like stretch marks, for example, it's never going to completely go away. Like I can make it better, you know, but I can't make them disappear without cutting them out. Yeah. So, you know, I try to set expectations and I tell them like my home run with stretch marks would be a 50% improvement. And if they're cool with that, let's do it. Let's do it. Thank you so much. I'm getting like a notice that we're going to die in like 20 seconds. So thank you, thank you, thank okay. you so much for your time Thanks, today. Thanks, Mariana. And I hope to see you soon somewhere in L.A. maybe. Yeah, <laughs> sounds conference. good. All right. Yes. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Great talking. Thanks for everybody watching. Thank Bye. you.